Could the rapture happen in my lifetime? This question, but only reframed in different ways, has wandered the corridors of many people's minds ever since the ascension of Christ. Could the rapture happen in my lifetime? Over the last 18 months, I know, at one point or another, most people have thought about what comes after this life. With everything that has happened in recent memory, more and more people have begun to think about their soul and their eternity. There are two events that can take you into eternity, either death or the rapture. So the question is once again, could the rapture happen in my lifetime? To be truthful, this is a question that you shouldn't dwell on, because whether Christ comes in the rapture or whether you die, you simply need to be ready. You need to know in whom you have faith. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but is often used to describe the events of Christ. When all believers, both dead and alive, will be received by Christ. Surely, this is Christ's promise. John 14.3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Christ indeed promised to come back for the saints with the purpose of dwelling with them. Do you ever think about heaven? I do. Do you really believe in heaven, Pastor? Yes, I believe in heaven more than I did yesterday, for I am one day closer to heaven than I was. John 14 Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Right now, Jesus is preparing a place for you in heaven. How does that make you feel? To know that your Savior, your Lord, your King, the one who loved you enough to die for you, is preparing a place for you in heaven. Do you comprehend that God could have chosen to let mankind die and go to hell? But he wanted eternal fellowship with you so much so that he was willing to pay the price for your sins. Whether we meet him through the rapture or death, it doesn't matter. Are you ready? Examine yourself. Are you ready? Are you absolutely certain? The time, date, or year has not and will not be revealed to any man or woman. But what we do know is that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. In the twinkling of an eye, the rapture will happen faster than we can even begin to comprehend what is going on. The twinkling of the eye is the time it takes for light to enter the eye, reach the back of the eye, 
and be reflected back out. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second, so the twinkle is about one billionth of a second. The reason the Apostle Paul used this term was to assure us of the supernatural nature of the rapture. It will be an event that exceeds human comprehension. It will supersede human understanding. Before you and I even know what is going on, it will have already taken place. Do you know what this tells me? This tells me that no human can change this. No human can affect this. The rapture will happen. The rapture will happen in the twinkling of an eye. You and I will find ourselves in the presence of the Lord. We will meet the Lord in the air. Therefore, don't allow anyone to derail you by saying they know the time or year that Christ will appear. It is pure deception and false speculation. The truth is it could happen today, tomorrow, or even 30 years from now. Our primary concern should be our readiness, because the rapture can happen at any time. Therefore, a believer should constantly live in righteousness and godliness. When the disciples of Christ, empowered and sent to preach that the kingdom of God is near, healing the sick and casting out demons, when they go back, they reported how the whole thing played out to Jesus. But Jesus replied to them in Luke 10, 20, saying, However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The first and foremost joy of a believer should be that he, she is saved. The salvation of your soul implies that you belong to God and you have the seal, which is the Holy Spirit, the assurance that when Jesus comes, your mortality will become immortality and you will be changed. The new birth is what should give you more joy than anything else. The reality that you are a child of God. Not everyone is a child of God, and the Bible is clear about that. Only those who are born of God by the new birth are the children of God. Your salvation now leads to the workings of Christ in your inner man, so that you will fully embody Christ and walk with Him. You begin to grow spiritually and continue to do God's will on earth. As you journey on earth, bear in mind that whether He comes when you are alive or not, your duty is to continue to focus on His Word, communicate with Him through prayers, and live a life based on biblical standards. Bible scholars argue whether Mark 13, 32 is referring to the second coming or the rapture. Whether it is referring to either one, it is important that you are ready. Mark 13.32 says, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. If the Bible confirms for you that no one knows, not even the Son, why then bother? You should be expectant and ready at every point in time, because it will be a sudden event. Philippians 3, 20-21 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Praise God! 
This is our possession as long as we remain in Christ and He in us. It says we shall be transformed from our mortal body so that we will become just as He is at His appearing. Thus, our mind should stay on the fact that our citizenship is in heaven and not this world. The Bible says we live in this world, but we are not of this world. Therefore, we should not live as though our lives end on this earth. As indicated by Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 51-53. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. This means that, at the coming of the Lord, not all saints would have died, slept in the Lord. That is, some people will still be alive, while some will have passed on. Death has no power over us, because Christ has swallowed death in victory, and He gave us eternal life. It is this life that will quicken our mortal body on the resurrection day for those who die in the Lord. Thus, the glorious occurrence is that the perishable will be clothed with the imperishable, and we shall all be transformed, both saints that are dead or alive. The question now is, will you be ready when the Lord shall come? Christ wants a glorious church, a church without blemish as his bride. Thus, we must disentangle anything that can serve as a deterrence against our readiness for the coming of our Lord. Both believers and the church are to prepare as Christ's bride and stay alert. So the answer to the question could the rapture happen in my lifetime? The answer is yes. But until then, we are to focus on being ready, because whether he comes here or we go there, we are to be ready. You and I need to be ready for what is coming. You may ask me what is coming. The rapture is coming. Matthew 24, 43-44 but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not of the Son of Man cometh. The rapture is an irregular event in which the saints in Christ, both dead and alive, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the skies. Although the rapture is a promise that is yet to be fulfilled, its reality will undoubtedly come to pass at the appointed time by God. The rapture is going to be a very sudden event, which will happen in the twinkling of an eye. However, the day and time of the rapture is not known by anyone. The event of the rapture will happen suddenly and at a time people least expect. The word rapture comes from a Latin word which means to cease something forcibly and in the Greek it's used, of a wolf sneaking up on a flock of sheep and stealing a sheep from amongst the flock. It's used for a thief entering a house and stealing something. Fundamentally, it indicates a sudden, forceful grab. And that is exactly what the rapture will be like. Jesus will grab us. He will reach down and grab you and me. But there is one key difference between the thief and Jesus, and that is, the thief takes what does not belong to him but Jesus will only take what belongs to him. This brings me to the million dollar question. Do you belong to Jesus? Because if you do, Jesus will come take you because you are his. There is a saying that we are all God's children. I actually thought for a long period of time that this was true, that we are all indeed all God's children. But this belief is not biblical. 
The children of God are those who are born of God. By the new birth, they are born the children of God. Jesus actually described people here on earth as being children of the devil. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abodeth not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. So I ask you again, who is your father? Because on the day of the rapture, Jesus will only come and take those who belong to God the Father. Jesus will only take those who are his, at his coming. Isn't that wonderful to be Jesus' people? To be his sheep? To be his disciples? To be the children of God? Oh, what a privilege. Jesus was referring to the rapture when he said that if a man had known when the thief would visit his house, he would have prevented his house from being broken through. Therefore, because of the sudden nature of the rapture, we need to be ready at all times in order to not be left behind if it happens in our lifetime. But you may say to me, I don't think it will happen in my lifetime. It is in your best interest to be ready. The rapture is coming, and we must all ensure we are prepared and ready for it. We must be on our watch for the rapture just the same way we would watch if we are aware that a thief will try to break into our house. How can you be ready or prepared to be caught up at a rapture? And what kinds of preparation are you expected to make to be qualified to be caught up? Paul highlighted the kind of people the rapture is meant for in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17, which reads, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It must be noted from this passage that Paul was not writing to unbelievers, but to believers in Christ. He wrote to them because they were discomforted by the death of their loved ones, thinking that they had lost the hope of resurrection and reigning with Christ. But the apostle wrote to enlighten them that at the rapture, the Lord will descend with the voice of an archangel who will blow the trumpet of God. At the blowing of this trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Notice that it is the dead in Christ that shall rise at rapture and not all the dead. Then all the believers which are alive will be caught up together with the resurrected saints to meet the Lord in the air. Those who died in Christ have already prepared for the rapture by living their lives for Christ. Also, everyone that is saved now is ready for the rapture. Your preparation for the rapture begins with giving your life to Christ first of all. Everything is about Him. It's all about Jesus Christ. He is everything to us. In Him we live and we have our being. You cannot truly know the Lord Jesus Christ and not love Him. He is unique. He is life. He is the heartbeat of every child of God because he is the living one. The Apostle Paul said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The Apostle Paul wanted the saints to know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Because of what Christ did on the cross for us, you and I have the assurance of eternal life. And those that die are asleep in Jesus. Jesus is the giver of life. You and I live. We have life in us. There are seven billion people on this earth and they all live. Angels are alive. Cherubims are alive, but there is no one in this universe that has life like the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. All life comes from Him. When we step into eternity, we will meet Him. And that is our desire. That is what we hunger and thirst for to meet him who came to this earth for my sins, to meet him who was born in Bethlehem, to meet him who was laid in a manger, 
to meet him who performed miracles on earth, to him who cast out devils, to meet him who raised the dead, to meet him who healed the sick, to meet him who opened up blind eyes, to meet him who was wounded for our transgressions, to meet him who was bruised for our iniquities, to meet him who took my sin upon him and died on the cross for me. He was dead and now look, he is alive forever and ever and he holds the keys of death and Hades and because he lives, I live and the Bible tells me that my life is in Christ. Everything is about him. It's all about Jesus Christ. He is everything to us. In him we live and we have our being. It's not about believing there was a man called Jesus. It's not about believing there is God. That makes you no different to demons. James 2.19 Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. To be saved is not believing there is a God. To be saved is not to believe that there was a man called Jesus. You need to repent and believe. Mark 1.15 The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repentance and faith go together because if you believe that Jesus is the Lord who saves, that is faith, you have a changed mind about your sin and yourself, that is repentance. And if you repent, it's because you trust that Jesus is the Lord who saves. It is only those who are in Christ that have the promise of the rapture. Whether they have passed on or they are alive, they can be sure that they'd be caught up to meet the Lord in the air at the appointed time. The unsaved are not ready for the rapture. And that is fine. It's their choice who they serve. It's their choice who they spend eternity with. The unsaved are not ready for rapture. This is because the Spirit of Christ is not in them. Romans 8.11 says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. It is only those who have the Spirit of Christ that can experience rapture just the way Christ ascended into heaven after his resurrection. Those that are yet to give their lives to Christ do not have the Spirit of God in them. Therefore, they are not prepared for the rapture. The children of God are ready for the rapture because they have repented and believed. Not just believed alone, but they repented from their old ways. They have turned their hearts away from sin. They now seek the Lord whilst he may be found. They represent the five wise virgins Jesus told a parable about in Matthew 25, 1-13. While they waited for the bridegroom, a symbolism of waiting for Christ at the rapture, they prepared themselves by carrying extra oil for their lamps in case the bridegroom will tarry. That is a symbolism of watchfulness. Jesus said we must be watchful because we do not know the day, neither do we know the hour when the trumpet will sound. Although there were ten virgins altogether, the five foolish ones were fools because they didn't see the need to carry extra oil for their journey. The oil is the symbolism of the Holy Spirit. While we wait for Christ's return, our watchfulness can only be enhanced by the Holy Spirit who constantly strengthens us. And preaching this message here today, there are those saints who died in Christ and those who are walking on this earth, and they are all doing the same thing. They are waiting. They are waiting. They are waiting. All the saints that have ever lived waiting. They are waiting. All the saints that have ever lived they are all waiting because in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, Jesus will grab those who belong to him, those who have repented and believed. I can see it now, our Lord saying, step forth. Oh, praise his name. All I can say to this is even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. 2 Timothy 
2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The Bible is a book full of warnings and instructions, and each and every one of the warnings and instructions in this book is written for our own benefit. One of the chapters in the Bible which is full of instructions and warnings is Matthew 24. Our Lord Jesus Christ in this passage literally gives you and me advice on how we can live in the last days. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus himself has given you advice on how you can navigate in this world you live in. So the title of this message is simple, Advice from Jesus on how to live in the last days. My sermon today will have four points. Point number one, don't be discouraged. Matthew 24, six through eight. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Jesus made it clear that all of these will be part of the last days, the perilous times. You need to focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. The truth is that all of these things will make life hard. They will make you want to give up. You are constantly hearing rumors of wars. You are constantly hearing about people dying and you don't know what to do. You feel like you are not safe. You feel like you cannot take these evils in the world anymore. Jesus said you should not be discouraged because of this. He said you should not be troubled. No matter what happens in this world, no matter what the government does in the country you live in, don't be discouraged. Don't live in fear. Remember that God is still on his throne. God is with you. I believe that if we all look back on the last 18 months of our lives and we can all testify to the fact that God was with us every step of the way. Isaiah 43.1 but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Isn't that wonderful? God is your creator. He is the former. He is your redeemer. That's wonderful. God says, you are mine. How does that make you feel to know that God says, you are mine? You are not the devils. You are not the governments. You are not a random social security number. No, my friend, God said, you are mine. You are his. Look at verse 2, Isaiah 43, 1. When thou passeth through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Wow. When thou passeth through the waters, I will be with thee. He said he will be with you. He won't send an angel or a care package or another human. God himself will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Have you been through the rivers of life? Have you been through the fires of life? Do you know who was with you? God. So when you see the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 24, 6 through 8, don't be troubled. God is still on his throne and God is still with you. Let Jesus order your steps in these last days. Point number two, do not be defeated. Matthew 24, 12 through 13, KJV. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You cannot allow yourself to be defeated in these last days. You cannot allow false prophets to lure you. You cannot allow sin to overcome you. You need to stay strong in this age. You need to grow strong and become strong in the Lord. You are not allowed to be defeated as a child of God. The reason why many Christians are not focused or remain in Christ is that they don't know what God has for them after this life. They don't think about the blessings that have been stored in heaven for them. This world is temporary. This world will fade and will never remain. 
You cannot live forever in this world. You are not immortal in this flesh. Don't allow the lust of the flesh to overcome you. Don't allow sin to overcome you. Don't allow the devil to overcome you. You have the strength of God in you. You need to remain strong in the Lord. Revelation 3.21 To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. You need to overcome all the challenges. You need to overcome all the problems. You need to overcome all the temptations. Point number three. Don't be deceived. Whether you like it or not, you live in an age of great deception. The God of this world is a God of deception. He is the father of lies. Deception is in his DNA. Matthew 24, 2 KJV. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Do not let anyone deceive you. Each time I read this verse, the words take heed always capture my attention. The words take heed actually mean to pay attention or look intently into something. In other words, our Lord Jesus is telling us to pay close attention. Pay close attention to what? To ensure that no man deceive. I have said it once and I will say it again. One of the worst things about deception and one of the most dangerous things about deception is that the people who are being deceived don't know they are being deceived. And our Lord Jesus is telling us to pay attention, to be on the lookout, to make sure that no man or woman will deceive you. Many people have gone away from the body of Christ because they allowed themselves to be deceived. Many are now in the synagogue of the devil because they believed what someone told them and not what God told them. This is exactly what the Bible said would happen. Look at this verse that speaks about the last days. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Don't be surprised when you see people following strange doctrines. The Bible told us this would happen. Don't be shocked. Don't be perplexed. Believe what the Bible says. Many shall depart from the faith. This is why you see churches that openly encourage adultery and fornication. Churches that openly encourage sexual immorality. Churches that openly discredit the Bible. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. The Bible told us this would happen. People will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. As a child of God, you need to protect yourself. Because the thing about deception is that most of the time a person who is being deceived does not even know they are being deceived. They think they are doing the right thing. They genuinely believe they are doing the right thing. Jesus warned us about deception multiple times. Matthew 24, 5 For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. What Jesus is telling us is that in the last days people will make grandiose claims of who they are and what they can do. People will make grandiose claims and promises. People will even claim to be Jesus himself. People will claim, if you give this amount of money, you will be healed. And people will fall for it. The number one way you can protect yourself from deception is for you to get to know your Bible for yourself. Get to know the Bible for yourself. That way, when anyone moves away from what this Bible says, you can pick up on it. You can identify it. Don't be rooted in a church, because the truth is there are churches that started well but over time, as they grew, they watered down the gospel. Don't be rooted in a person, because people change. Be rooted in the Word of God, the unchanging Word of God. People can change, churches can change, but do you know what doesn't? The Word of God. Isaiah 8:20, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If there is disagreement between God's word and the word of the messenger, it isn't hard to figure out who is wrong. The messenger is wrong. The word judges the messenger. The messenger doesn't judge the word. 4. Don't be doubtful. Matthew 24, 34-35 KJV Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. There is something that pleases God more 
and that is called faith. When you have faith in God, it means you also have faith in his words. That means you believe in God, but if you allow doubt in you, you will destroy the faith you have in God, and God will not be pleased with you because it means you don't believe in him. God is saying that he will make things new for you. Do you believe that word, or are you doubting it? Jesus said he will go and prepare a place for you in heaven. Do you believe, or are you doubting these words? This world will fade. Everything will be gone, but the word of the Lord is something that can never go unfulfilled. All these things that we have been told about the last days are not just fictions or ordinary guesswork. They are things that will happen, and if they don't happen, the word of Christ will remain and will never fade until it happens. The word of God will remain. That is what you should hold on to. That is what you should base everything about your life on. The word of God is great, perfect, and accurate. Don't be doubtful. A perfect example of this is the rapture. So many Christians have become more and more doubtful about the rapture. They have listened to people who say people have been preaching about the rapture for decades and it has not happened yet. A man once said to me, I heard the rapture being preached about 40 years ago and it still hasn't happened yet. Brothers and sisters, we need to remind ourselves that God does not operate on our timetable. We need to humble ourselves. God does not operate on our human scale. The events on God's prophetic calendar will take place when the appointed time comes. Do not be distracted. Distraction is one thing that can make you miss out on the peace that Jesus will give. Many things can distract us in this world. There are things the devil is bringing every day to make us go away from Christ. Not that these things are not working because people have gone away from Christ already, but we need to make sure we focus on one thing, and that is Christ. The Bible says in Matthew 24, 42 KJV that, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. The most important word here is watch. Stay focused. Don't be distracted by anything. Focus on the race set before you. You are meant to stay alert and remind ourselves that Lord Jesus will return at any time. Hebrews 12, 1 KJV. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about what with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us.